Charles Dickens wrote a famous novel called The Tale of Two Cities. I too, this morning, will give you a tale of two cities, not London and Paris in the 18th century, but Faridabad and Gurgaon. If in the 1980s, if you were a young person with ambition, you were told, go to Faridabad. And because Faridabad was considered the future, future of Delhi, it, was, it had an active municipality, a state government that was behind it, industri an industrial, vibrant industrial estate, rich agriculture, a rail connection to Delhi, and a state government determined to show that Faridabad was India's future. The other city was a sad story. Gurgaon was wilderness, rocky soil, pitiable agriculture. Even the goats ran away from Gurgaon. Today, Gurgaon is the millennium city and an engine of India's economic growth. Seven golf courses, 36 million square feet of commercial space occupied by the world's largest corporations, fabled apartment complexes. And Faridabad today is still fighting corruption and groaning under the weight of red tape and official extortion. So what happened? What happened? Gurgaon's disadvantage turned out to be an advantage. No government meant almost, almost no government, meant less red tape, less corruption, less <laughs> less, um, less people to tell you what you could not do. Builders and self-reliant citizens dug bore wells when there was no water, put up gensets when there was no power, built schools when there were no schools or very poor governing, performing schools, the kind that uh, Rakesh just talked about, and similarly with health. Now, New India is, in a sense, Gurgaon writ large. It's a story of private success and public failure. And people in Gurgaon, when they look around, they sometimes ask themselves, why do we need government at all with corrupt politicians and negative bureaucrats? And they shrug their shoulders and say, India grows at night when the government sleeps. Now, to rise without a state is a brave thing. But is it wise or sustainable? Shouldn't India grow during the day? Wouldn't Gurgaon be better off with functioning drainage system, roads, sidewalks, parks, libraries, a decent transport system? So both corrupt Faridabad and laissez-faire entrepreneurial Gurgaon are not the models for India's future. Farida would, Bad would be happier with less corruption. Gurgaon would be happier with functioning services, as would the new India. It should not take us 10 years to build a road, which takes three years somewhere else. It should not take us 15 years to get justice. A bureaucrat who works three hours a day and another one who works 12 hours a day 
They should not get promoted on the same day. Something is wrong. And this is why I wrote the book, India Grows at Night. But I did not complete the sentence because I thought it would be too cons insulting, which was when the government sleeps. So in this book, I make a case for a liberal, effective state, or a liberal, strong state, as Fukuyama would call it. Now, what is an effective liberal state? It has three pillars. One, it has an executive with capacity, which an, effect, an, an executive that can get things done. Second, that executive must do those things within the rule of law. And third, <coughs> that executive should be accountable to the people. These are the three pillars of a modern liberal democracy. All our, all our obsession of the last 70 years has been with accountability, but not with capacity, state capacity. You read papers by political scientists, it's almost always about accountability. But few talk about the fact that what's letting us down in India is state ability, state capacity. You know, India is a bottom-up success unlike China, which is a top-down success. Meaning China, it's an amazing bureaucratic elite that has built great infrastructure and led and, and, and the most amazing success story of modern, of our times. In India, it is really the, the individual. It's a, it's a people's success. Individuals have somehow educated themselves even in not so good schools, dug into their family savings to do provide health care to their families. And it is individuals who really are India's success story. And that's why today we have 25 globally competitive companies that my Chinese friends tell me are the envy of China. Because they know that their companies are state, mostly state-owned, and they will never be nimble enough to compete. This Chinese friend of mine comes to visit me off and on, hoping to get stock tips. But he has stopped coming, because he thinks I may have given him some bad tips. <laughs> but he came one day. And he had been traveling in, the, in Haryana, in the small uh, industrial areas. And he was looking for investments. And uh, so he had a backache. I said, what's the problem? He said, your roads. How did you become the second fastest growing economy in the world with these kind of roads? So I scratched my head, and I said, well, you know, India grows at night. <laughs> and he couldn't understand how a country could rise without the active, without an active state. And he thought about it, and he asked, you mean India has risen with one hand tied behind its back? And I nodded. And then he said, you know, the nightmare of the Chinese leadership would, should be, what if that second hand got untied one day? Now, the mistake we make when we think of India and China is to say, well, who will get rich first? Questions like that. The fact is, that's not the race. Both India and China are going to be respectable, middle-class countries. 
China is well ahead. But India too. India too will 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 have will be will be will will be a middle class middle income country. The race is that both these middle income countries will get stuck in what economists call the middle income trap, what Latin America got into. And so the real race is this one, which is. It is a race between India's ability to fix governance and China's ability to fix its politics. Whoever does that will then be able to go and become a fully developed country. It will not be easy for India to fix its governance. It's much easier to do economic reforms. And the, 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 the main reason is that the main reason is that India has always been a weak state and a strong society. China, on the other hand, has always been a strong state with a weak society. And the fact is that you need both. You need a strong state to get things done, and you need a strong society to make that state accountable. India's history is a history of kingdoms, warring kingdoms. China's a history of empires. In the Indian was always defined by your place in society, your family, your village, your caste. The Chinese was always defined by the state. The law in China was given by the emperor and then interpreted by the emperor. The law in China, in India, preceded the king, dharma, and the job of the king was to uphold dharma for the sake of the people. So very early on, we actually created, in the Magadha Empire, in the Magadha Kingdom, one of the first kingdoms, we created a liberal division of powers. We created a liberal division of powers that actually made the state weaker. So oppression in India never came from the state, or very rarely came from the state. Oppression in India came from society. For example, the Brahmins. And the answer to that oppression was the answer to that impression was the renouncer, the Buddha, the gurus who came, the bhakti saints. They were the answer for, to, to fight oppression. So in 1947, we could not have been, we could not have been anything but a democracy. And today, we are a bottom-up success rather than a top-down success. And so the movements like the Anna Hazare movement a few years ago was a collision between the state and society. So given these obstacles, historical obstacles, what needs to be done? Well, what needs to be done is a reform of governance, reform of the state. And when I put this question to Mr. Modi a few years ago, I said, you know, I said that the real reforms are these. And he said, you know, even Margaret Thatcher did those reforms in her second term. So, Mr. Das, you better wait for my second term. So I hope if he does get reelected, that he will remember that promise that he made. And ultimately, we also need a change. What Tocqueville called the habits of the heart. India, people in India, 
vast majority believed that in 1948 or 1950, we got a constitution that fell from heaven. And they never really believed that this constitution, which, by the way, if you read the constitutional debates, people in those debates regarded nation building as dharma building. It was considered a dharma text. P. V. Kane, who won the Bharat Ratna, called it. He spoke to Radha Krishnan and called it a dharma shastra. And so it was a moral project of nation building. And that's why the dharma chakra is in our flag. But now the point is that dharma chakra is not, that wheel is not moving. And we need to sell the constitution. We need to sell the constitution as an unfinished project. You know, the Americans, every day in school, college, every institution, they sell the constitution. And one of the reasons we have not been successful, Nehru gave a lot of speeches, but Nehru's speeches were that of a Western liberal. Gandhi, if he had been around after independence, he would have sold the Constitution as a dharma text. Because in the freedom movement, he took the same ideas of liberty and equality that are in our Constitution, but he sold them as sadharan dharma. And so this is another unfinished project. It's not just Mr. Modi having to enact in his second term governance reforms. We need to, to remember that, 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 the, that, that the Constitution itself is something that we need to serve. Anyway, my, my time is up. I'll just say at the end that the rise of India has been the defining moment of my life. It's also good for the world. At this time when Western economies are searching their soul with regard to this model of democratic capitalism, a nation is rising in the East, which in fact is rising on the back of democratic capitalism. And all we now need to do is to fix some of those weaknesses that I have pointed out to go to glory. Thank you.